Good morning. Thank you all for coming by. Um, we had a Halloween night to remember, and now it's All Hallows Day. And we get to think about the question when all the smoke clears away and all the pain and fear and doubt have been suffered, what are we left with? It's a good time to hold a conference, I have to say, because there's so much we need to think about together. And I'm very grateful to the people who came from France and came from Boston and came from China and Korea. And we, when we gather, we gather good. I'm, I'm thrilled by that. Lots of years went into being alone before all of a sudden we were all together. I want to do some remembering today, but I mostly want to think about forward. Because what we have is a moment at which we can be very clear about our success and also very clear about our failure. When I started thinking about the question of technological freedom and its relation to political and civil freedom in the world at the end of the 1980s, um, the connection escaped pretty much everybody. And a few of us, kid geeks, who had been working the system of mainframe computer software when that was the only game in town in our teenage years and in our early adulthoods, we, we had a, a concern, a thing that bit us in the middle of the night when we weren't thinking about fixing the one computer programming problem that was living in our heads that moment. The concern was that computers not under the control of the people who used them could eradicate human freedom, could change the ecology of human life in drastically undesirable ways. And so without having much reference to go by except the science fiction that we read as children of the 1960s, which taught us that the unintended consequences of technological supremacy could be the destruction of the world, we began to try and think, each of us in different places, different corners, different ways, what we would do to secure the long term of freedom from the technology we loved and worked with and wanted to make stronger and better all the time. By the beginning of 1990, I had come to the conclusion that the single most important thing was to have strong, publicly, strong public key encryption for the masses. That without the ability to keep our secrets, we would have none and freedom would disappear. And so I went looking for a tool with which to address that question. And Philip Zimmerman found me or I found him and off we went. If we hadn't done that work, if the United States government had prosecuted Philip Zimmerman for PGP and sent him to jail and eliminated the program from the world, I think it is quite reasonable to suggest that we would have no freedom in humankind anywhere on earth at the present moment. We thought then that there was a way by sharing software and by using it in the interests of human freedom to save ourselves from a nightmare we were having. The only thing is that it would require us to change the way software was made all around the world by everybody. But we did that. But we did that. Here we are at the end of the second decade of the 21st century and we all now agree that the way to make software is by sharing, that software is a form of knowledge which exists like mathematics or science to be shared, to be understood by everybody, to be learned by anybody who wants to learn all the way from the commencement of learning to the state of the art using stuff that everybody's allowed to read and tinker with and share and use in any way that she, he, they want. That's an extraordinary fact that we have that consensus. That certainty, which now embraces the entire industry, all our old adversaries are now our friends. This proposition is accepted and everybody makes everything the way we set out to have it made. The extent of that, at least 
if, if you were one of the kids wandering around wondering if this could be done is awesome. No doubt about it. And on the other hand, we didn't get the freedom that we wanted. We are not even actually successfully preserving the freedom that we thought we had. On the contrary, we've made tools for everybody and the tools are very good. And the tools are being used in ways that are directly contrary to what we thought we meant. And those who wish to perfect despotism in the world are using them very effectively, consistently and with a purpose which is not ours. And the industry of information technology with which we wanted to be friends and allies and which came to help and believe in many of the things that we did and which made a ton of money from it, are also now engaged in activities of surveillance of human behavior on a scale around the world which is frightening even by the standards of the 20th century we were trying to end. Everything we thought we knew about how important it is for freedom of thought, that reading not be surveilled, that everybody not be watched, that every room not have a camera and a microphone in it, everything we thought we were trying to head off, we helped to build. And now we help to run. And now we live in the middle of the very nightmare we were trying to wake up from when we were kids and we thought they were just our fears. And now they are the reality of the human race. This point of inflection, this moment when we complete our win and acknowledge the depth of our failure is the most interesting moment in the whole story. And it happens at a time when we are also beginning the generational transition from the people who started it to the next generation that will inherit both our successes and our failures. This is the moment in which the movement regroups itself understands what it has achieved and understands what it has failed to achieve and passes on its wisdom to a new generation of leadership. All of it right now. A good time to have a conference. A nice time to have a conversation. I have a real sense of anticipation, I have to say. Michi and I have spent months consulting with the program committee and holding some meetings and begging people to show up at our little Friday gathering and, and, and now we're here and it's about to run. I think we have an extraordinary set of conversations to have today. Some of them are inside baseball, no doubt about it. If you're not a FOSS lawyer, some of this will not seem like the top of mind to you. Because there have been a lot of conversations that have been going on in our community that we think we can contribute to by bringing parties together and talking about it. Things about licensing, things about patent defense, things about the growth of the multinational global movement and business which we now live amidst. And some due consideration to what it is that we didn't manage to unscrew up in time. Nine years ago, just about exactly at this time of year, I was giving a talk about how to have freedom in the cloud downtown. And I said in the course of that talk, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has done more harm to the human race than anybody else his age. He was 26 then. And I think a lot of people there thought as usual, gee, Edmund is really crazy. <laughs> but if I had said in the following sentence that evening at NYU, and nine years from now, tens of millions of you are going to agree with me, <laughs> then people would really have thought that I had lost my mind. And here we are. Because the other thing which has happened in the world since we began 
is that the idea we had trouble conveying, the one we had the most trouble teaching, which wasn't we should have a Unix of our own, or we should make a lot of stuff and share it, or we should just make up a better way to do C compilation that would actually blow the socks off everything else. All of those ideas we got very quick across. Everybody got it. Some people quickly, some people a little more slowly. But in the end, we didn't have any trouble teaching that. The idea we had trouble teaching was if you don't control the software in your computers, then you will be controlled. People just didn't believe that. And we never figured out how to explain that to anybody who wasn't way too much like us for comfort. Now people know. Now people know. When I talk to the incoming European Commission, it knows. When I watch the face of American politics flying by and Mr. Zuckerberg in Senate hearings, they know. When we talk about what it is that's happening in the streets of the world where young people are, and why suddenly the government of Spain wishes to rip an app off GitHub or else, they know. We have a moment now at which the problem that we foresaw, that mumbled in the pit of our stomachs when we were kids, the thing that we were worried about that we never quite managed to figure out how to explain to other people has been explained. And if we're going to be grateful to them for anything, we should be grateful to them for that. They taught the meaning of software freedom to the world. They just don't know it's software freedom yet. So we have only one little gap to close. But we have to close it billions of people wide now across all the languages and all the cultures and across a generation gap which has grown up with all this technology and never really understood what we were fearing because it's so convenient and they took to it so naturally and it's the world in which they live and the water in which they swim and if you want to explain that that water is basically unclean and that we need to clean it up even if they're beginning to smell there's something wrong with it there's still a little bit of work to do so today is a conference about that. Everything we did get done, everything we failed to do, and how now we turn the corner in the free software movement. We discovered that we're not just geeks talking to geeks anymore. We're not just programmers chatting about programming. We did have in our minds from the beginning a thing that is now troubling the world. And we have to figure out what to do about that.